Hello everyone, welcome to History and Culture. In the third year of the Jeqing reign, 1798, Emperor Qianlong of the Qin dynasty, who had officially abdicated the throne to his son Jiaqing, celebrated his 88th birthday. In that year, Emperor Qianlong not only marked his own birthday but also personally presided over the wedding of his 14-year-old great-great-grandson Zaishi. He even acted as the groom himself. At the age of 88, after celebrating his birthday, he also welcomed two young and beautiful girls of 14 or 15 years into his palace as concubines. These events shed light on how vibrant Emperor Qianlong's life was during his three years as an emperor emeritus. His post-abdication life can be described as one of holding absolute power while accompanied by beautiful women. One of the most significant things he did after abdicating was to bring down the corrupt official Heshen. He orchestrated Heshen's downfall, which infuriated Jiaqing and led to Heshen's execution as the first action of his reign. While Emperor Qianlong's abdication may seem noble, he was not entirely willing to step down. Who would willingly give up being an emperor in good health to become an emperor emeritus? Throughout history, most emperors emeritus were forced to abdicate due to unexpected events. Emperor Qianlong was the only one who voluntarily abdicated under normal circumstances. However, his abdication was not a sincere decision. He had promised earlier that if he lived long enough, he would not reign longer than his grandfather Emperor Kangxi. He aimed to secure Emperor Kangxi's reputation as an eternal emperor. Therefore, when Emperor Qianlong reached 60 years of reign, he chose to keep his promise of not surpassing Emperor Kangxi's 60-year reign and announced his abdication. Yet, it should be noted that the fates of Emperors Emeritus who abdicated were quite tragic. King Zhao Wuling died of hunger after abdicating, and both Emperor Li Yuan, Tang Gaozu, and Emperor Li Longji, Tang Xuanzong, faced neglect and a gloomy old age after stepping down. Thus, Emperor Qianlong did not want to share their fate. Emperor Qianlong wished to avoid ending up like them in his old age. He decided to abdicate without relinquishing his authority. He gave up the title of emperor but retained control over military and political matters. He had the final say in personnel appointments, official documents, military actions, and other significant decisions. Emperor Jiaqing, on the other hand, attended various large ceremonial events, resembling a mascot of the nation. One of the most telling signs of Emperor Qianlong's retention of power was his refusal to vacate the Yongxin Hall after his abdication. Since the reign of Emperor Yongzheng, Qin emperors lived in the Yongxin Hall. Despite living there for 60 years, Emperor Qianlong declined to move to another palace, citing inconvenience. Emperor Jiaqing, as the new emperor, was left with his childhood residence, the Yuqing Palace. Before the abdication ceremony, Emperor Qianlong refused to hand over the imperial seal, a symbol of imperial power. Additionally, he had promised to remain in the Yongxin Hall. If he adhered to this, Emperor Jiaqing would have neither the imperial seal nor a suitable palace. To resolve this situation, Lu Yong, the Minister of Personnel, and Ji Xiaolan, the Minister of Rights, advised Emperor Qianlong to either move out of the Yongxin Hall or hand over the seal. Lu Yong even suggested halting the abdication ceremony altogether, restoring Jiaqing to the position of Crown Prince. Under the counsel of Lu Yong and Ji Xiaolan, Emperor Qianlong concluded that he should neither withhold the imperial seal nor remain in the Yongxin Hall. Halting the abdication ceremony would damage his reputation for keeping promises. Emperor Qianlong aimed to be praised as a wise and virtuous ruler of a prosperous era. He believed that abdicating during a time of national strength would showcase his noble character and secure his place in history. Consequently, Emperor Qianlong decided to hand over the imperial seal to Emperor Jiaqing during the abdication ceremony. However, he created another seal called the Emperor Emeritus Seal and declared that all edicts required both the Emperor's seal and the Emperor Emeritus seal to be valid. This move was intended to weaken Emperor Jiaqing's authority and allow Emperor Qianlong to maintain control. 
In the first year of Emperor Jiaqing's reign, 1796, during the 19th day of the first month, Emperor Qianlong hosted a banquet for and received envoys from Korea. According to protocol, Emperor Jiaqing should have received the envoys. However, it was Emperor Qianlong who received them, and Emperor Jiaqing could only sit beside him at the table. Emperor Qianlong even made a meaningful comment to the Korean envoys, although I have returned to the status of an emperor, matters of the military and the state still require my approval. Through these actions after his abdication, Emperor Qianlong conveyed that the ultimate decision-making power of the Qin dynasty still rested with him. The central figure of the abdication ceremony was not Emperor Jiaqing, the succeeding emperor, but the retiring Emperor Qianlong. The ceremony concluded amidst a chorus of praise extolling Emperor Qianlong's nobility and greatness. Although Emperor Qianlong handed over the imperial seal to Emperor Jiaqing, he had already crafted a seal of his own, symbolizing his status as an emperor emeritus. He announced that all edicts required both the emperor's seal and the emperor emeritus seal to be effective. This move was intended to diminish Emperor Jiaqing's authority and maintain Emperor Qianlong's influence. In summary, Emperor Qianlong's behavior after abdicating reveals that he did not truly desire to step down. He abdicated only due to his promise not to exceed Emperor Kangxi's reign. In reality, during the three years from Emperor Jiaqing's succession to Emperor Qianlong's death, Emperor Jiaqing resembled a crown prince. Emperor Qianlong remained vigilant, fearing that Emperor Jiaqing might seize his power. To prevent this, he even used Hushan to manipulate Emperor Jiaqing. In the second year of the Jiaqing reign, 1797, Emperor Qianlong's health began to decline, and his ability to speak started to deteriorate. However, his mental faculties remained intact. Coincidentally, this was the year when the chief counselor for military affairs, He Gui, passed away. Fearing that Emperor Jiaqing might exploit the situation to seize power, Emperor Qianlong promoted Hushan to the position of chief counselor for military affairs. In reality, this move was to continue his influence through Hushan and sideline Emperor Jiaqing, preventing his son from taking advantage of the situation. During court sessions, Emperor Qianlong sat on the central dragon throne, Emperor Jiaqing sat below him, and Hushan stood by Emperor Qianlong's side. Due to Emperor Qianlong's declining language skills, his speech became unclear, and even Emperor Jiaqing struggled to understand him. Only Hushan, skilled in deciphering Emperor Qianlong's thoughts, could comprehend his words. Thus, Hushan became Emperor Qianlong's spokesperson. During this period, Hushan further assisted Emperor Qianlong in suppressing Emperor Jiaqing's influence, leading to the zenith of his power. Emperor Jiaqing gradually developed deep resentment towards Hushan. However, with Emperor Qianlong's support, Emperor Jiaqing could only tolerate Hushan to some extent. Consequently, Hushan acquired the nickname Second Emperor of the Qing Dynasty. However, this relationship would lead to Hushan's downfall. Although Emperor Qianlong was well aware of Hushan's corruption, Hushan's ability to manage finances and accumulate wealth made him indispensable. Hushan always managed to provide funds whenever Emperor Qianlong needed them. Emperor Qianlong desired both reputation and money, and Hushan's ill-gotten gains actually contributed to Emperor Qianlong's image. While Emperor Qianlong left behind a positive reputation, Hushan shouldered the blame. Emperor Qianlong's reliance on Hushan's financial prowess ultimately led to his own entanglement with Hushan. After Emperor Qianlong's death, Emperor Jiaqing promptly executed Hushan. Emperor Jiaqing despised Hushan for manipulating him through Emperor Qianlong's support and for channeling his dissatisfaction with his father towards Hushan. After abdicating, Emperor Qianlong did three notable things. Firstly, he held a banquet for the elderly called the Thousand Elders Feast. This tradition involved inviting individuals aged 65 or older to the imperial court. Emperor Qianlong's grandfather Kangxi had initiated this practice. Having witnessed his grandfather host the Thousand Elders Feast during his childhood, Emperor Qianlong decided to follow suit. In the 50th year of his reign, 1785, 
at the age of 75, Emperor Qianlong held the Thousand Elders Feast for the first time. After his abdication in the first year of Emperor Jiaqing's reign, 1796, he organized the second feast. The Thousand Elders Feast became an opportunity for Emperor Qianlong to flaunt his accomplishments. He boasted of his prosperous era, his longevity, and his role in shaping an unprecedented golden age. Although the feast was grand, it ended tragically. The event led to the deaths of several elderly attendees due to overexcitement or exhaustion from the journey. The second important action was suppressing the White Lotus sect uprising. After the feast, a White Lotus sect uprising led by Wang Sanchai erupted in the Sichuanchu region. This uprising significantly impacted the Qing dynasty, contributing to its eventual decline. In the initial stages, the White Lotus sect uprising posed a challenge for Emperor Qianlong. However, he cleverly utilized the uprising to further consolidate his power. Unexpectedly, Wang Sanchai's leadership of the White Lotus sect uprising persisted throughout almost the entirety of Emperor Qianlong's reign as Emperor Emeritus. Only in the third year of Emperor Jiaqing's reign, 1798, in August, after marshalling a force of 100,000 troops and allocating 7 million taels of silver for military expenses, was Wang Sanchai eventually captured by the imperial army through deceitful means, leading to the end of the uprising. Emperor Qianlong immediately ordered Wang Sanchai's execution upon his capture. Emperor Qianlong believed that such a severe punishment would serve as a deterrent against rebellion. Proudly declaring this as a tremendous achievement, Emperor Qianlong even included suppressing the Wang Sanchai rebellion as one of his ten greatest accomplishments. However, the White Lotus sect uprising was not fully quelled with Wang Sanchai's death. It took until the ninth year of Emperor Jiaqing's reign, 1804, to completely suppress the uprising. The Qing dynasty invested more than eight years to finally eradicate the White Lotus sect uprising, depleting significant national resources. Moreover, this uprising eventually gave rise to the Tiandihui, Heaven and Earth Society, movement. In the 18th year of Emperor Jiaqing's reign, 1813, the leader of the Tiandihui, Lin Qing, led his followers into the Forbidden City, causing Emperor Jiaqing to flee in panic. These events marked the beginning of Qing dynasty's decline. The root cause of the White Lotus sect and Tiandihui uprisings was the poor governance during Emperor Qianlong's later years. Widespread corruption among officials and their exploitation of the populace forced the common people into rebellion. The third significant action was Emperor Qianlong's late-life romantic involvements. At the age of 88, Emperor Qianlong married two young girls aged 14 or 15, who would later become the concubine Jean and Shugiren. Unfortunately, Emperor Qianlong passed away the following year, leaving these two young girls widowed after less than a year of marriage. They were left to live a widow's life in the palace with other elderly concubines, some of whom were in their 60s or 70s. These two young girls were condemned to the confines of the palace, living with concubines old enough to be their great-grandmothers. Their lives were undoubtedly tragic, and as a result, both concubine Jean and Shugiren had short lifespans. Shugiren passed away at around the age of 24 or 25, while concubine Jean lived slightly longer, passing away around the age of 40. Emperor Qianlong's decision to marry these young girls was perhaps one of the most unfortunate choices he made in his later years. He had little time left in his life, and yet, his decision trapped these young girls in the palace, leading to their premature deaths as widows. Thus, in the three years of Emperor Qianlong's life as Emperor Emeritus, he engaged in actions that were not entirely commendable. His governance in his later years contributed to corruption in the Qing dynasty's administration, exploitation of the people, and a deteriorating domestic and international situation. Although it cannot be solely attributed to him, his mismanagement contributed to the Qing dynasty's overall decline during his son Emperor Jiaqing and grandson Emperor Daoguang's reigns. This is History and Culture Channel, like and subscribe are the biggest help and support for us, thank you everyone, see you next time.